Ships, big and small, await their turn at the entrance to the fabled Panama Canal. The vital shipping link between Atlantic and Pacific saves vessels the long and perilous voyage around stormy Cape Horn. The canal traverses 80 kilometers of land and lake across the Isthmus of Panama. Aside from the bridge of a ship, this is the best place to view the locks in action. Welcome to the visitor's center. Welcome to Panama. Please come with me. Some 2,000 visitors a day come to see this marvel of early 20th century engineering. They have to pass through a security check. This is a sensitive area. Javier Pimentel is a guide at the Miraflores Scenic Overlook. All the guides must be fluent in at least three languages. He memorized all the facts and figures long ago. The canal brings in approximately five to six million dollars a day. It operates 24 hours a day, moving 35 to 40 vessels in that time. In the PM, the ships pass in one direction, from the Caribbean to the Pacific, and in the AM, from the Pacific to the Caribbean. The great container ships are pulled through the locks with only inches to spare by massive electric tug locomotives called mulis. If a shipping company decided not to use the canal and sail around South America instead, it would take two to three weeks longer and cost ten times as much as what they'd pay here. So if we're talking about a big ship, using the canal would save a million to a million and a half US dollars, and it saves time and work too. Flying a Panamanian flag saves even more money. The locks work a bit like vast water-filled elevators. The ships have to be raised more than 26 meters to the level of a string of artificial lakes. At the other end, they have to be lowered back down to sea level. The next vessel follows close behind. The idea of a passage for ships across the isthmus was born in the 1500s, when European navigators first realized Central America's unique geography. This is the history room. Here you can see how the canal was constructed, at first by the French, then by the United States. In 1880, a French company started work on a lockless canal. Bad preparation and the sheer enormity of the task doomed the attempt from the start. The tropical climate and diseases dealt it its death blow. 22,000 workers died of yellow fever and malaria. The Panama Canal Company declared bankruptcy. In 1903, U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt sent warships to aid a separatist revolt in the then Colombian province of Panama. The Mosquito was identified as the carrier of malaria and measures were taken, but nonetheless 5,600 more workers died. In 1914, the first vessel passed through the newly opened Panama Canal, an engineering feat that has worked trouble-free for almost a hundred years. But the roll-on, roll-off freighters and container ships are growing ever larger. The world's biggest locks are now too small. To stay profitable, the Panama Canal must expand. Rigoberto Delgado is an engineer in charge of one aspect of the current expansion program. He goes over details with visiting experts. To the south, toward the Pacific Ocean, we see the Bridge of the Americas. The bridge was constructed in 1962 using German steel. From the canal's entrance to Miraflores, it's about 14 kilometers, and that's where dredging is currently underway, removing some 9 million cubic meters. By the time the expansion is complete, 50 million cubic meters of soil and rock will have been moved. And the canal has to be bomb-proofed as well. 
Sometimes, for example, nuclear submarines with battleships pass through the canal or ships with sophisticated technology on board. But we don't grant visas to terrorists here, nor to anyone else who doesn't follow the international security norms. Hank Hesling of the Netherlands works for a German underground engineering company, one of many contractors bidding for a slice of the 3.8 billion euro expansion budget pie. The plan is for the expansion program to be complete in 2014, exactly 100 years after the canal opened. Given the historical context, to be involved and to do this work is something very special. In the area where the new locks are being dug, the effects on the natural environment become apparent. If you look over there, you'll see a little river being diverted. It used to empty into the Miraflores Lake, but now it runs to the sea. Critics worry that the canal's expansion will come at the expense of the rainforest and its biodiversity. The Panama Canal Authority lobbies the public with pro-environmental projects. We're also contributing to reforestation, not only in this area, but in other parts of the country as well. We're reforesting areas that have been affected by other projects. Foreign investors can purchase licenses. Forests are planted and eventually felled for timber with no taxes levied. It's an ecological pilot project. For over 40 years, the Bridge of the Americas was the only road connection between North and South America. That changed with the opening of the Centennial Bridge in 2004. We drive on to Panama City, the perpetual boom town. In some ways, it could be called the Switzerland of Latin America. Panama still respects the confidentiality of banks. More than 80 are based in the country. The financial crisis was a non-event here. Panama City is modern, cosmopolitan and bursting at the seams with immigrants from all across South America. At the same time, Indios wearing native dress are not a rare sight in the Casco Antiguo, the Old Town and elsewhere. Even the poor among the Panamanians are relatively well off, as Marco Antonio Casanova will confirm. He's been shining shoes in the capital for decades. Here in Panama, if someone's out of work, it's only because they don't want to work. Even if it's just looking for shoes or cleaning or guarding something, there's always work to do. Anyone who says there's no work in Panama is just a slacker. Marco Antonio likes to tell people his name is Mark Antony. There's no doubt he's a patriot. I'm proud of my country, my flag, and even my pride. My Panama is a very beautiful country. No matter what your race, politics, or religion, no matter if Russian, Italian, or German, you are welcome in Panama. It's hard to leave after a welcome like that, but duty and curiosity call. The capital of neighboring Costa Rica is San Jose. It rains here nine months of the year. We're headed for Costa Rica's most popular tourist destination. The region's most prominent feature is the Arenal Volcano, one of the world's most active. You have to get up early to catch La Fortuna in all its splendor. 5 a.m. is good.
At this hour, about the only ones at El Hardin for breakfast are locals. Cowboys get up early. The owner, Jesus Miranda, serves light but hearty meals. But Miranda's bread and butter are the tourists. Tourism is very important to La Fortuna. It means lots of jobs and lots of revenues. It's very, very important. But now, it's down just a little. Otherwise, the financial crisis has had little effect on the Ticos, as Costa Ricans are known in Central America. Like the boom, the crisis is part of the cycle of life. Things come and go in life, and new things take their place. The true wealth of Costa Rica, the rich coast, is its flora and fauna. It's called the Mesoamerican Biodiversity Hotspot. Tourists come to see the rainforest from the hanging bridges. A private investor has installed the network on a 250 hectare private nature reserve. Even in the midst of the forest, visitors must be very patient and a bit lucky. Just being here is an incredible experience. It's a temple of plant life, an absolutely wondrous place. She wraps herself around her prey until it can't breathe anymore and it dies of asphyxiation. But in this case, we can't see the prey because she's just eaten it. Now she'll spend a couple of weeks here just resting and waiting out the period of her digestion. Ants live dangerously, even in the rainforest. <laughs> The visitors stroll through the rainforest in safety on a swinging steel catwalk, literally with their heads in the trees. They don't necessarily see all the creatures they hear, but even as an auditory experience, it's spectacular, sometimes breathtaking. In 1950, 72% of Costa Rica was covered with rainforest. Now it's barely 25%. For decades, Costa Rica encouraged cattle ranchers to cut down rainforest to cater to the world's insatiable hunger for beef. Now that's no longer official policy, but cattle are still a mainstay of the country's economy. Here in the north, some 4,000 head are auctioned off every week. It's a quick and easy way of doing business. The ranchers drive up with their cattle and drive home with cash in their pockets. Luis Angel, president of the industrial cattle ranches of Costa Rica, sees the potential for growth. Every year we grow a little more, and every day we learn a little more from our experience in doing business. And now we're expanding according to our growth plan, with new auctions in other parts of the country already taking place. Our business is made up of stock breeding, with a little dairy farming and growing crops besides, chiefly rice.
cattle ranching and monocultures of rice, sugarcane, oranges and pineapples have taken their toll on the rainforest. But new progressive environmental policies are turning things around. It's not quite 50 kilometers from La Fortuna to the Finca San Rafael. Businessman Leo Prostler bought a finca or country estate to plant forest. It's a project of his firm Baum Invest. His son Stefan is the site manager. Baum Invest's objective is to turn a profit from investing in the environment. Investors acquire shares in the expectation of a return in about 20 years from the sale of precious woods. Hola. Buenas. Can it really pay off? The maverick entrepreneur Prisler started out as an engineer, running Mannersman's steelworks for many years. Eventually, his ideals caught up with him. He wanted to do something for the environment, something that would have a lasting effect. He wanted to bring ecology and economy together. In Germany, you hear a lot about protecting the rainforest. In other words, I'm not allowed to make use of the forest. It has to stand as an object in itself and represent nature. But here, if I were to plant more rainforest, just to let it stand and not bring any revenue in and not integrate it into the social system, well, I've already been criticized for that here. They say, look, we don't want you turning our land into a national park. Over 10% of the new forest is to be designated a nature reserve. Prustler's model stands on three legs, ecology, economy and social integration. The ecological leg takes a lot of hands-on work. In the sapling stages, you have to care for the trees like you would a little child. They have to grow big enough to withstand the challenges of living here. There are lots of creepers that can choke the life out of a little tree and stunt its growth. It took 30 workers to plant the new forest. A cattle ranch only needs one cowboy to run it. Currently, San Rafael has a full-time staff of 10. Working with pineapples, you breathe in all sorts of chemicals they spray on them. But working with forestation, you feel a lot better because everything's natural. The air you breathe has nothing toxic in it, so it's much better, much healthier. The economic leg takes a lot of patience. It's an extremely long-term investment that takes decades to mature. <laughs> Leo Prostler is off to a good start. Several mid-sized business owners in Germany saw good potential and bought in, in spite of, or perhaps because of, the global crisis. At first we were a bit worried that people wouldn't have any money left after the crisis hit. And I don't call it the financial crisis, but the fraud crisis. But people are finally starting to realize what it means to invest in wood as a resource. The resource forms the basis. But it's dwindling even as the demand steadily grows, simply because there are more people. The 90,000 precious wood trees have to be cared for. That creates jobs. At prices running several thousand US dollars a log, it could pay off. And the investors can even feel good about it. Marlena Pavon is profiting even now from Prustler's model. She's a 32-year-old single mother and a farm labourer. She lives directly on the Finca. Stefan confirms that Marlena works at least as hard as any man. She has no choice. Her husband abandoned her. I have four children and one grandson, and I have to work to provide for them all. I want them to get ahead and study someday. 
I have to keep working whenever I can. There are hardly any jobs to be had here. You can only work odd jobs here and there. Marlena has a piece of ground on the finca that she can work to provide for her family. Still, it isn't easy. In no time at all, it's overgrown with weeds, and you have to take a machete to them. I haven't had time for that because I go to work and come home very tired. I do the housework, and sometimes I go out to clear away the worst of it. I always plant corn and beans, and they've always grown very well. We'll see, God willing, I can plant a little something again this year. Only time will tell just how profitable Leo Postler's model really is. But he's not waiting to find out. He's already bought another finca. It's only a few kilometers from Los Chiles to the Nicaraguan border. Here, the pavement ends abruptly. We hear music coming from the Nicaraguan side. There's hardly any cross-border traffic, but there are cars and people waiting. What for? The Costa Rican guards give no comment and don't want to be on camera without their commanding officer's permission. But out of uniform, people here are more talkative. I pick fruit in the orchards. I have to keep working from 5 a.m. until the transport leaves at 5 in the evening. So I'm about to go home. This job is how I get by. Before long, things start to move. Those are taxis. Here in Nicaragua, we're legal. We're not wetbacks. Here we call them pirates. We're legal. We have our papers in order with a stamp from the city hall and everything. From this point on, we work legally. But from here and the other way, the Ticos work illegally. They're pirates. <laughs> The Costa Rican's ethnic diversity nearly matches the region's biodiversity. On the Rio Frio, boaters can cross into Nicaragua quite legally, but they can still get wet. A few minutes later, the downpour is over. And all along the Rio Frio, the animals, birds and reptiles appear. Children come out of nowhere and go swimming apparently unconcerned who or what might be watching. But the real star among the fauna is El Blondi del Rio Frio, an apricot-coloured monkey unique to Costa Rica. In the next part of our series, we cross over to Nicaragua and the Salentinami Islands. <laughs>